Good evening, and please turn in God's Word to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes 7, verses 19 to 21, 19 to 29, beg your pardon. And let's uh, read these verses and then bow our heads in prayer before our Lord and ask His help and blessing on us as we study them. Verse 19. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself cursed others. All this I have tested by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been as far off and deep, very deep, who can find it out? I turn my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things, which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, in this passage which does seem somewhat difficult to us as we look through it, as we try to understand the interactions of one verse upon another and, and what is the flow, we, we do submit ourselves to you and ask for your help, for your spirit to guide us into understanding and into living these things out as we should. Please grant us all and grant me help as well as I preach. Grant us all your help, Lord, to do and to understand for your name's sake. Amen. In the C.S. Lewis book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the children are once again exploring new and strange places in the land, the world of Narnia. And in one scene, Lucy finds herself alone with a great book, a magician's tome full of dangerous spells that intrigue and tempt her. As she pages through it, at first Lucy resists the urge to read these spells, but eventually comes to one that she chooses not to deny, and she gives in. I mean, it seemed harmless enough at first. It was a spell which would let you know what your friends uh, thought about you. And in all of a hurry, for she feared she would change her mind, she said the words of the spell, and all at once she saw the very last thing she expected— a picture of a third-class carriage in a train with two schoolgirls sitting upon it, or in it. She knew them at once. They were M Marjorie Preston and Anne Featherston. Only now it was much more than a picture. It was alive. She could see the telegraph posts flicking past outside the window. Then gradually, like when the radio was coming on, she could hear what they were saying. Shall I see anything of you this term, said Anne, or are you still going to be taken all up by that Lucy Pevensey? Don't know what you mean by taken up, said Marjorie. Oh, yes, you do, said Anne. You were crazy about her last term. No, I wasn't, said Marjorie. I've got more sense than that. Not a bad little kid in her way, but I was getting pretty tired of her before the end of the term. Lucy, on hearing what her friends were saying about her, is dismayed. Well, you jolly well won't have the chance any other term, she shouts, two-faced little beast. But the sound of her own voice at once reminded her that she was talking to a picture and that the real Marjorie was far away in another world. Well, said Lucy to herself, I did think better of her than that. 
and I did all sorts of things for her last term, and I stuck to her when not many other girls would, and she knows it too, and to Anne Featherstone of all people, I wonder are all my friends the same? No, I won't look anymore, I won't, I won't, and with great effort she turned over the page, but not before a large angry tear had splashed on it. I mean, it's a small part of the overall story of that book, but as is often the case, it illustrates our text uh, this evening quite well. There's someone who is unable to control their urges, who seeks after forbidden knowledge, who hears the depravity of man echoed in their speech, who takes to heart things that should be ignored, and yet who is as guilty as those she condemns, and who gives in to her passions, all of which is profoundly foolish, and all of which can be avoided by embracing biblical wisdom. Now the overall context of this entire middle section of Ecclesiastes is the tension that the believer experiences in seeing the righteous perish in their righteousness, and the wicked flourish in their wickedness. And if God really truly is sovereign and good, how can this be? Solomon, the preacher, began by giving us some critical life lessons relating to our, our outer circumstances in chapter 6 and the first part of chapter 7. And we saw that prosperity is not always good, that adversity is not always evil, but God is always sovereign. So if we really have a concern for our outer circumstances, we will humble ourselves before Him and live as He commanded us uh, because He knows the future as the past. Then last time, we began in verses 15 to 18, and there was a, a pivot from our outer circumstances to our inner character. When Solomon repeats his dilemma about the, righteous of the and righteousness and wickedness, and he begins to answer in view of our response to those situations. He says that a person can be, never be righteous enough or wise enough to save themselves, nor righteous enough or wise enough to accuse God of being unfair if something bad happens to us. So he concluded, embrace righteousness and wisdom, and do not embrace wickedness, as that will certainly bring God's wrath, talking to our inner character. And now he carries on with this theme. And while this is a, a single flowing argument, I'm breaking it up for ease of understanding and the hope that the framework that I'm giving it will, will help us follow. So my first point, looking at verse 19, is simply this. Embrace the wisdom that governs oneself. Again, we're talking about inner character. We're talking about the work of sanctification as we cooperate with the Spirit of God in making us to be what we should be in Christ. This is a message for Christians. Embrace the wisdom that governs oneself. He says there, verse 19, Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Well, what is the function of a ruler? It is to govern to govern well. So Solomon imagines a city that is ruled by ten rulers, ten being an exaggerated number that will stress the benefits that come to the city by virtue of having so many competent officials. But that's just the picture. That's the illustration that he's employing. So he's not wistfully imagining the right sort of political leaders. His point is that wisdom practiced by the wise man will make you strong. Stronger than an army of bureaucrats striving for perfect control. You say, okay, but how does wisdom make a person strong? I mean, obviously, physical muscles are not in mind. So, so what sort of strength is this in verse 19? Well, the answer is, it is the power to prevail that comes from wisdom. The power to prevail. And I'm going to quote someone else here because he said it so well, I won't try and reframe the, his words. He said, wisdom governs the thoughts, so the wise person knows how to process things in a God-centered way. Wisdom governs the will, so the wise person knows what choices to make. Wisdom governs speech, so the wise person knows what to and not to say. Wisdom governs action, so the wise person knows what to do in any situation. Wisdom is a powerful resource for the person who possesses it. End quote. And, and what wouldn't you give to have this sort of wisdom? To be able to govern, rule your thoughts. 
without allowing them to grow anxious or distracted or obsessive, to rule your speech, to know what and when and how to say something, to rule your will so that temptations fade and emotional impulses aren't followed, to rule your actions so well, so effectively that you hardly ever put a foot wrong or make the wrong decision. It would be amazing, wouldn't it, to have the strength of this wisdom to govern ourselves. I wish I could claim to be so strong, so wise, so consistently, don't you? I mean, how much would you pay if you could click on wisdom and add it to your shopping cart and order it online? What's its value to you as a commodity? Says the Bible, the price of wisdom is above pearls, Job 28, 18. Better than jewels and all that you desire, Proverbs 8, 11. Better than gold and silver, Proverbs 16, 16. Like a bubbling brook of refreshing water, Proverbs 18, verse 4. Superior to money, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 12. Because it helps you govern yourself for right living in a fallen world with all these contradictions and tensions and frustrations and miseries. So knowing this as you do, there should be a very eager an earnest desire in every Christian to soak up and soak in as much of God's wisdom as opportunity allows. Because it makes you strong. You know, I think of that line from the Lord of the Rings where Gandalf talks about the Ents and he says, they're about to wake up and realize they are strong. Now, I'm not suggesting that Christians are strong in and of ourselves. We're not. We're weak. We need, we need God's strength. But the point is, God provides the wisdom that makes us to, to be strong in Christ, to govern our thoughts and our speech and our actions and our impulses and feelings. And knowing that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom, there should be an eagerness within us to attend to those things that will grow our fear and reverence for God so that we may be wise, so that we may be strong, stronger than ten rulers in a city. There should be an eagerness to pursue the reverence of God, to be regular and engaged at services of the church, to be zealous in seeking His face in quiet, private, personal, devotional worship to plug yourself into the life of a local congregation so that wisdom may come of your fear of God as you serve one another, to deny the inclinations to procrastinate and put off what is so necessary. Then you will grow strong instead of being storm-tossed, wise instead of foolish. Have you ever wondered why it is that the most committed Christians in a congregation are usually the most balanced, self-controlled, and stable. And the most peripheral Christians are usually the quickest to fall apart. It's because wisdom grows out of the fear of God and obeying His commandments. And that wisdom makes a person prevail. However, as helpful as wisdom is, never forget it does not make you to be sinless. Second point. Embrace the wisdom that knows oneself. Verses 20 to 22. Verse 20 there. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Remember that also that when the Bible uses the words wisdom and righteous, it often does so synonymously because the one who is wise will live righteously and the one who is righteous is living wisely. But no amount of wisdom that we might attain, no amount of self-governance and self-effort will make us to be righteous before God, positionally righteous. This is the universal testimony of the Bible. It's in stark contrast with the belief of the Pharisees. It's in stark contrast with the beliefs of modern man. We cannot live so well as to be righteous, as to merit God's favor, to be good in and ourselves. We are not good. We are fallen and sinful creatures. Nor are we so wise as to be able to even know what to live well looks like. 
Psalm 143 verse 2 says, David says, No one living is righteous before the Lord. In Romans 3, Paul writes, None is righteous, no, not one. In Proverbs 20 verse 9, it says, Who can say I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. Who can say that? Answer, no one. Only massive self-deception would persuade a person otherwise. In fact, this whole section is, is just full of um, the themes of our unrighteousness. Verse 20, sin. Verse 20, 20, 21 and 22, cursing. Verse 25, wickedness. Verse 26, sinner. Verse 26, again, uh, implications of sexual immorality. Verse 29, scheming. It's illustrating, isn't it, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So verse 19, which we read about governing ourselves well, the wisdom that governs well, is not holding out to us a path of personal enlightenment as a way of perfection. It's not saying that with enough good decisions and enough morals and some good hygiene, you'll get there, you'll get to heaven. It's not saying that with some grit and determination and some science and some math and some laws and some literacy, mankind can save ourselves through wisdom. It's not saying that. Because verse 20, surely there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Even if it be one so wise as Solomon who wrote this book. And just in case we're not convinced, he gives us a practical personal example of this ugly fact in verses 21 and 22. One that illustrates the need to both know ourselves, to be sinners... And to govern ourselves as saved sinners once we are saved through the gospel. What does he talk about? He talks about our speech. Always our speech. How often does God go to our speech to highlight our unrighteousness? As someone has said, the proof that all humans are inescapably flawed lies right between our teeth. Verse 20. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. And that's just devastating. I mean, it, it violently strips bare any facade of self-righteousness we might ha have. It, it lays us naked, exposed before the eyes of the one to whom we must give an account. First, he talks about what we might hear from others who talk about us. The implication, we're going to get a bit worked up, a little bit self-righteous, a bit defensive. But having drawn us in, what does Solomon do? He hits us with the left hook, and he tells us not only not to worry about it, and he drops the bombshell and says, you're just like them. You know it happens because you're guilty of this yourself. I mean, anyone feel the, feel the prick of, of conscience here? As Blaise Pascal put it, if all men knew what each other said of the other, there would not be four friends in the world. You've done it yourself, haven't you? I know I have. After church, at work, in school, at college, after leaving someone's home, after having someone leave your home, begun to talk about other people in a less than righteous manner? Why are the elders like that? Why don't the deacons do this? So and so is such and such. Why do they let their kids run around out of control? They never seem to discipline them for anything. Or, conversely, why are they so strict with their children? I wish the parents would just lighten up. Uh, did you see the interior decorating, that clash of colors, that choice of furniture, the wildly different styles? Who does that? What bizarre taste they have. Why are they so obsessive about that one issue? Why doesn't she ever stop talking? I can hardly get a word in. Why doesn't he tidy up his garden like any good steward would do. It's been years. That fixture is still broken. Are they ever going to fix it? Did you hear them complaining about money, seeing where they live, knowing how much they make? 
And they can be a bit snobbish, always talking about their fancy trips and expecting others to match their lifestyle. Or they can be a bit tight-fisted, uh, but, but slobbish, not snobbish. I don't know why they don't just clean up. Why don't they just buy new clothes or get, get something done? Why do they always bring their kids around when they're sick? Don't they know they make my kids sick? I can't afford to take them to the doctor the way they can with the cost of medical care. Or conversely, why if there's the slightest sign of a sniffle, do they lock down their home more tightly than South Africa doing lockdown? Are they germaphobes or something? He's so disorganized, she's so controlling, they're so opinionated, I wish they weren't so stubborn, I wish for once they just arrive on time, uh, uh, they have no consideration, I wish for once they wouldn't obsess about the time, does it really matter? I'm not supposed to tell you this, please keep it confidential, but did you hear about so-and-so? And on and on and on and on, you can make up some more. In the words of Solomon, your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others, slandered others, grumbled against others, gossiped against others, mocked others, illustrating what? You are not so righteous as you imagine. You sin more than you even realize. As one commentator so elegantly puts it, for my whole life I've been told that I sometimes sinned, morally missed the mark, but I was never told that I was a sinner, that in my very nature I was inescapably sinful and thus I inescapably sinned, until we discover in ourselves that Dr. Jekyll is Mr. Hyde, that is, that we all have dark impulses and evil actions, we will never get very far on the walkway of wisdom. In other words, know yourself. But Solomon's burden here is not to correct our tongue in the saying, although we could spin off from that for a long time. His burden is to correct our heart in the hearing. Verse 21, if it so happens that you hear someone else say something mean about you behind your back, because they do, you know, they do, and you know they do because you do. But if those words reach your ear, do not take it to heart. That is the path of wisdom. Do not take it to heart. Outwardly, you don't have to redress every offense, balance every insult, counter every nasty word. And inwardly at the heart level, you don't have to hold on to it. You don't have to sit with it and mull over it and agonize over it and stress over it. Wisdom says just let it go, let it pass, let love cover the multitude of their sins against you. Because if you don't... It will eat at you, worry you, anger you, and bitter you, affect you. And if you're having trouble letting go, if letting that offense pass seems so bitterly difficult to you, to your proud spirit, remember what you are. Remember how many times you've done the same sort of thing. Know yourself. Not so as to remain as you are. Not, not with some sort of wicked fatalistic excuse of saying, oh, well, I am just what, that's just who I am. I'm, I'm the product of my upbringing. I, I'm, I'm an old dog. I'm set in my ways. I can't change. Not saying that. Not invalidating the power of the gospel to change what you are into what Christ would have you be. But to know yourself and recognizing that you will not be all that you should be while living in this fallen world, and you will not make others to be what you wish they could be living in a fallen world, and they will not meet our expectations of what we want them to be. Don't make your mission uh, to inquire of the opinions of others about you or to care what others might say in that respect. Don't take it to heart if you hear them curse you. Show them the same grace you would desire from them if they heard your mutterings, this is the path of wisdom, to not be overly concerned when others speak against you. Then thirdly, embrace the wisdom that submits oneself to limitations, to divine limitations, God's limitations. Not that God is limited, but that he limits how much we know. All this I have tested, verse 23. I said I will be wise but it is far from me 
that which has been as far off and deep, very deep, who can find it out? You can see his frustration here, can't you? But also his acceptance of his limitations. And remember who's speaking. This is Solomon of all people. Wisest man barring Christ ever to have lived. And yet in his quest for wisdom, in his quest for perfect governance and knowledge of himself, he does not say, I've made fantastic inroads, I've almost got there. He says, it's far from me. And then compounding the point he repeats, he says it was deep, it was very deep, or unfathomable, exceedingly unfathomable. It's like what David said uh, in Psalm 139, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. He, he feels his shortcomings in this respect. And this very human dilemma produces a question in verse 24, one that assumes you already know the answer. Who can find it out? Who can search out wisdom? Who can plummet the unfathomable depths of wisdom and knowledge and understanding? If Solomon can't do it, who can? Answer, no one but God, who is the author of wisdom. Solomon understands the limits of his understanding as the creature, limits placed upon him by the Creator. And this is so remarkably different from the attitude of postmodern man from our generation, which makes itself to be the arbiter of truth and knowledge instead of the recipient of truth and knowledge. That, that sits in judgment on God and His Word instead of trembles before God and His Word. That cynically rejects any of the majesty of mystery in God's infinite being and infinite doings and insists instead, demands and an explanation within the parameters of a finite sinful creature. You know, man says if something isn't perfectly comprehended according to humanistic philo philosophical understanding, if it's not to be replicated in a laboratory according to modern scientific method, if it's not peer-reviewed by acceptable panels of se secular intellectuals, if it's not politically correct or socially acceptable according to the flavor of the day or the fickleness of the mob, then it is to be mocked, it is to be questioned, it is to be, to be rejected. Man tries to strain the Bible through the insight of Instagrammers and 260 character postings on Twitter. They try to pour the immensity of the eternal God into a laboratory test tube. And when the great I am doesn't fit, they say, he is not. He is not there. He is not wise. He is not loving. He is not just. He is not powerful. He is not worthy. Because man exalts his wisdom against God. And what's worse is that even as Christians, we can be guilty of this sort of arrogant intellectualism. We can be guilty of the sin of Eden, the attitude that caused Adam and Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit and plummet the human race into death and sin, the arrogant assumption that we deserve more than what God has revealed to us. I was listening to someone recently who said that many in the church live with a great deal of spiritual frustration because they feel it is their inherent right to know what God knows. That until everything makes perfect sense to them, they will resent God for the mysteries they find in His Word and they experience in His life, answers to which God only holds to Himself. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Knowing the limits of wisdom is part of wisdom. End quote. Anyone here like that? Anyone frustrated with the Bible because it speaks to you about mysteries you, you don't understand? Whether it's predestination or something else and you just don't like it? Anyone making just a little bit too much of your own powers of reasoning instead of submitting to what has been revealed? Anyone disappointed with God because He, he lets something into your life and you just want to know why? Why, God? That's all I want to know. It's just why, and then I could live with it. Why did you let it happen? Well, here's the pathway to peace. The secret things belong to the Lord. He sets the limits of our understanding 
of our ability to comprehend even the limits of our wisdom. Accept those boundaries He's placed. Trust Him and carry on in obedience. And may I say to parents that this is a big part of raising godly spiritual offspring. Train your children to be comfortable with not knowing certain things. Not knowing the future. Not knowing why the Lord permits certain events. Not knowing how God will prove faithful to His promise in a situation that seems to offer no obvious answer at all. Train them to be happy not to know. And to just have that beautiful, elegant, simple faith that says, I know that my God knows. Again, I don't mean discourage them from asking questions. Like the defensive parent is too lazy to try and find the answers. And I don't mean discourage them from learning about creation and how the Creator has made it to work and function within the laws of physics like a, a foolish parent who pretends that God doesn't work through means. And again, I don't mean dumb them down to stunted infantile Christians who never grow in their theological depth or understanding like the delinquent parent who refuses to mature in their own faith so as to train others. What I mean, though, is train them to be comfortable with divinely imposed mystery when it's there. Dad, how come God is three, but also one? How is Jesus God, but also God's Son? I don't understand. Neither do I, Son. But I believe it, because He says it is so, and I study this truth because it's glorious. Mom, why doesn't God make Granny better? Why doesn't God heal me? I don't know. But I know what I know. And that is that God is good. And we may pray to Him and trust Him in all of His ways. Grandpa, what does the future hold? How will God make His ways work when you're not around anymore? They don't look like they're working to me. Shouldn't we try something else? I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me. Of weary ways or golden days before His face I see. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to commit that which I've committed unto him against that day. Comfortable with the mystery. Our kids need to see it in us. John Calvin put it like this. Let us not be ashamed to be ignorant of some things relative to a subject in which there is a kind of learned ignorance. Rather, let us abstain with cheerfulness from the pursuit of that knowledge, the affection of which is foolish, dangerous, and even fatal. In other words, there is wisdom in a learned ignorance to know that you can only know what God says you can know and to be at peace with that. To be comforted as much as we would want our children to be comforted when we tell them, don't worry about that, mom and dad have got it handled. To submit oneself to the limitations that God divinely has put upon us. Fourthly, embrace the wisdom that denies oneself. And this is probably the most tricky point here, verses 25 to 28. Solomon again speaks about that quest for perfect wisdom, one that branched out even, he says, into wickedness and foolishness in verse 25. He's just looking everywhere. It's a quest he's failed at. But then he tells us he did find something in verse 26. And if you read this wrong, you'll come away with the very wrong idea. Verse 26 is the key to these verses through to verse 28, and we'll come back to it. But he speaks, he says there, about a discovery more bitter than death. And he describes a woman, one whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are fetters, that is, chains, a cunning and manipulative woman who uses her feminine wiles to entrap men to do her will. Now, such women do exist. And they even occasionally exist in the church. But then again, so do such men. As the New Testament warns. Says Solomon here, 
He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. God takes pleasure in the one who wisely resists temptation, flees temptation, but the one who gives in is taken by lust, becomes her puppet and plaything, is captured by folly to do her bidding. And then Solomon continues his analysis, verse 27. Behold, he says, pay attention, this is what I found, while in the midst of all my pursuit of wisdom and meaning and all my efforts and excesses, adding one thing to another to figure life out, something I really wanted to do, verse 28, I sought for it repeatedly, but I haven't got there. Here's my conclusion. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. And the previous context tells you what sort of man or woman he's talking about. The man or woman who acts wisely, who is upright. So it says, Solomon, I found one in a thousand men and no woman. And that's where the confusion of this text begins to arise. A confusion that will be embraced by those that are willing to believe the worst of God and who search the scriptures for excuses to reject it. But before we take the wrong understanding, let's see what Solomon means. For starters, is Solomon a sexist, misogynist, woman-hating male supremacist? Would that be a fair assessment of his character? Not hardly. He wrote a whole book in which a young woman was the central character, Song of Songs. He personifies wisdom itself as a woman in Proverbs 1, not as a man. He extols the character of godly woman in Proverbs 31, obviously well aware that such women are found within the covenant community of God's people. He speaks of the excellent wife in Proverbs 12, the wisest of women in Proverbs 14, the prudent wife in Proverbs 19. He tells men to enjoy life with your wife whom you love in Ecclesiastes 9. In Proverbs 18, he says, one of the greatest blessings that can come to a man is a godly woman. And of course, Solomon is not a forgetful man. He's not forgotten examples of women in the history of Israel. He knows of the courage and faith of Deborah in Judges 4 and of the Hebrew midwives in Exodus 1. He knows of the pious and prayerful Hannah in 1 Samuel 1 and the righteous Abigail who stopped David, his own father, from an act of foolishness and wickedness in 1 Samuel 25. And had he lived longer, he could have spoken of other women too, those known to us and unknown to us, people like Holder and Esther and Mary and scores of faithful women to this day. So no, this is not Solomon the chauvinist bearing his colors. Plus he's already said back in verse 20 that there's not a righteous man on the earth, let alone one in a thousand, and that's hardly a ringing endorsement of men, is it? And when verse 29 says they sought out many schemes, it actually uses the masculine pronoun in the Hebrew. It is the men who are behaving wickedly there. So what do these verses mean? Well, of course, the immediate context of the verse is verse 26, the seductress who leads away from wisdom. And that would fit with Solomon's previous teaching, again in Proverbs, where there is a woman called wisdom calling to a young man, just as there is a strange woman, a woman of folly, that is trying to seduce the young man. And so that imagery is almost certainly in Solomon's mind because he's using the same type of language. But there's also this number here, 1,000, that has some significance in connection with Solomon. Of course, he's probably using it poetically, like when we say one in a million, but you can't get away from the fact that he may be thinking of his own circumstances, 1 Kings 11, now Solomon loved many foreign women. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. So 1,000 women in Solomon's life, not one of whom was a righteous worshiper of Jehovah, all of whom were idolaters, and they led his heart astray because Solomon the man foolishly married unbelievers. Instead of yoking himself to a righteous Israelite woman from amongst God's people, he yoked himself to Moabites and Ammonites and Edomites and Sidonians and Hittites and Egyptians. And so now in his old age, in his letter of repentance, Ecclesiastes, he muses about how exceedingly few There are in the world that pursue righteousness and wisdom. He says, one in a thousand of the men that he knows, and not even one of his pagan wives. 
So it's an example from his own experience, but not an example from everyone's experience, obviously. But what then is the point in raising it now? It is simply this. Remember I said verse 26 is the key here. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. It's to say this, pursue lady wisdom, but flee lady folly. Flee lady death. Flee the strange woman of Proverbs, the seductress that will pull you into wickedness and folly. Deny sinful passions, not just, just, just lust, but any evil passions, whether it's greed or fits of anger or drunkenness or that whole list in Galatians 5, the, the deeds of the flesh, the passions of the flesh. Deny the urges, deny the impulses, deny the foolishness that could lead you from the path of righteousness. Do that and you, you please the Lord. You bring pleasure to God, your Creator. Otherwise, you'll be captured. And it's as though he's saying, consider me. He followed every fleshly desire and the outcome was utter disillusionment. Was a thousand women enough for him? No, not even that could satisfy. Nothing but God can satisfy. So wisdom calls to us saying, deny yourself the path of folly. Deny yourself indulgence in anything wicked. Don't go to the place that you will surely fall. Don't mingle with those that will surely lead you astray. Don't watch what will surely lead you to sin. Don't neglect your self-watch. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't trust your heart. Don't listen to your heart. Don't follow your heart. Know yourself. Govern yourself. Deny yourself. And follow Christ. And that brings us to the conclusion, which is the fifth point. Embrace the wisdom that assigns no blame to God. Verse 29. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Again, the context, the frustration of seeing the righteous perish in their righteousness and the wicked flourish in their wickedness, and maybe the temptation there is to, to put some blame on God somehow for this predicament. And maybe that temptation is there. And now he ends with a simple declaration that God is blameless. And God is not responsible for sin or evil. Verse 29, God made man upright, blameless, pure in the Garden of Eden. That's, that's how Adam was created. He had every advantage. A holy creature in a holy place under the holy God, gifted with a holy wife, Eve, cherished and beloved by his creator, but still, verse 29, they, masculine plural, mankind, have sought out many schemes. It's not the fault of God that sinners do the things that they do or feel the temptations that we feel. God has never and shall never do wrong in his creation, but only what is right and just and wise. So in anything you see in all the world, in all history, anything at all, God is blameless. Man sins. Yes. God enacts calamities. Yes. And believers, Christians, are caught up in such things at times. Yes. But God has done no wrong. In fear of God, we must wait and trust and follow His will, for that is the path of wisdom. And we look, as we think about verse 29 there, we look not to the first man who was created upright but fell, but to the last man, the last Adam, the creator who became man and never fell. Not to the first Adam who, like Lucy, looked in the book for forbidden knowledge, who fell at Eden when he reached to eat of the tree's fruit. Now we look to the last Adam who died at Calvary and was raised for our justification. We look not to the first Adam, the symbolic head of a foolish, sinful humanity, but to the last Adam, Jesus Christ, who became the head of redeemed humanity. The one whom Isaiah spoke of in that passage is about the suffering servant. Behold, my servant shall act wisely, and by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. Wisdom and righteousness attached to the servant, the only true servant of God. Jesus is a man who embodied both. One who was not controlled by urges and impulses, 
like Lucy, like you and I at times, one who did not seek to defend himself in the face of insult, one who never spoke an errant word or an evil word, one who, like a pure spotless lamb, was innocent and blameless as he went to the cross to die for those who had spoken evilly and done evilly and thought evilly and even felt evilly, for those that would embrace him as Lord and Savior and mighty God by grace through faith in his name. We look to the last Adam. We look to the perfect man, the wise man, the righteous one who alone can save us. We look to Christ, the wisdom and power of God, and we fear him, we revere him, we follow him, and then we're on the path of true wisdom. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, in the midst of this world of temptations and confusions and sufferings and afflictions and persecutions and stumblings and falls on our part, we pray that you would keep our vision fixed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who is all our righteousness and all our wisdom and all our hope. We ask you, Father, to forgive us our many sins, to bear with us in our failings and to Revive our spirits to empower us by your spirit for obedience to your name. To be with us as we seek to follow you. To bear us along when we fall and restore us when we go astray. We ask for your help, Lord, because we know that we are not naturally righteous in ourselves. We know, Lord, enough about our hearts to know that our hearts are sick. But we also know that you have the one who changes hearts. who declares your people to be righteous through faith in your Son. And in that we rest and take our hope. And in your name we ask these things. Amen. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.